Hello and welcome everybody to this uh, series of Women of Significance in STEM, where today we have the pleasure of meeting with Philippa Lewis, who is a very established and experienced company director, uh, company advisor, uh, and, and executive in the medical technology, healthcare, aged care industry, both in Australia and globally. So today we're going to explore a little bit of Philippa's uh, career story and some of her secrets for success. Welcome, welcome Philippa. Thank you, thank you for having me. So if uh, we could start with a little bit, perhaps if you could share with us uh, what you are doing now, who you serve, and, uh, and how you came to be doing what you're doing. Mm, yeah, love to. Um, right now, I'm serving on a number of boards in the capacity of a non-executive director or chair. Um, and that involves companies in the general med tech or biotech space. I've had a very long interest in the area of general medical technology and um, I find it an exciting and um, obviously from a human perspective, a very valuable area to be contributing um, in your daily work. So to be able to serve on boards or chair companies and if you like direct the strategy and so forth, it's a very rewarding position to be in. I will say it's not quite the same as being the CEO because the CEO is in the cut and thrust of the daily effort, um, shaping and forming the business uh, but at a board level or at an advisory level it's quite exciting because you get to parachute in and out of different areas uh, and and gently contribute in a way that's quite material but in a different way to that of an executive so my um, key areas of interest is I'm, I am chairing a uh, an oncology therapy company at the moment called Immunexus um, I'm engaged with a couple of AI companies that are developing some interesting medical technology relating to diagnostics in, in um, certain areas of disease. Uh, and um, I'm also very active in the aged care sector, both on the technology side, which primarily in that sector, it's all about assistive technologies, um, different forms of software, sometimes medical devices and so forth. Um, and, um, and in that sector as well, I'm doing a, a rather large um, consolidation project. So a lot of M&A activities. So um, it's the sort of work that I do, it's, it's rather varied, uh, and yet there's some commonality between it all. Most of it is underpinned by forms of technology um, being either perhaps disruptive, but also um, being happy to be a change agent in an area Often these areas, of course, are very resistant to change and can be very, um, uh, it can be very difficult to coerce uh, the cohort um, into areas that are quite um, innovative. But um, that's, that's what I like doing. And so that's really what I love to do is the, the difficult stuff, the hard stuff, the complicated stuff, because um, that's what a lot of people don't want to do, I guess, and that's why I like doing it. And how did you come to be doing this work, Philippa? Look, I've had a long career in business. I had my first business when I was 18 and um, I've been in healthcare and in particular the aged care sector for about 30 years. I've done quite a lot of startups and in those startups I've done, um, you know, I always think startups come in two different camps, possibly three different camps. One is inventive, one is innovative, and then the third is a combination of the two where you're able to invent and then innovate and then bring to market something that's that's different or interesting. And I've always liked to be in the third camp, thinking of ideas that can make a difference to people in, in an area of um, either technology or medicine or therapeutics and to, to then commercialise that and bring it to market. Having been in the aged care sector for a long time, it's regarded often as the if you like, the poor relation of healthcare. But of course, we all know that there's an enormous cohort of humanity in that um, area. Uh, and much is done, can be done, and will be done to enhance the lives of older people. Well, so we I've are an said, ageing industry, aren't we? Or globally, you know? We are globally ageing. And um, 
there is a lot that can be done and is being done with that particular part of humanity. So I've always been interested in that. So I've been involved at businesses where we've just developed quite unique areas of wound care or the management of various disabilities, assistive technologies. Um, and each of those businesses or companies that I've founded um, have grown. Um, they've been involved in licensing technologies or um, uh, becoming rather large distributors of some products or services that relate to um, areas of, of either medical support or, or, or technology in the form of software devices. So I guess over those 30 years, I've transitioned from being in parts of industry where one was dealing with simple concepts through to where we are today, where we're looking at personalised medicine and um, precision medicine um, and uh, the, the sorts of things that are, can, uh, that are occurring in those areas, I find um, particularly interesting. And, and what's really interesting about the sector is that the capital that involves itself in the sector is often pretty smart, actually. And um, you can actually uh, be on a continuous learning curve about the sector you're, you're operating in because there's a whole lot of information or data, let's say, that's being fed in to you as a board or, or, or as a company that completely revolutionises often the way you think. So we often think the disruption and the invention is coming from internally within your organisation, your CSO or your head of R&D or whatever. But actually, if you can be outward looking, you can actually pick up a tremendous amount of innovation, um, disruption and new ideas from those external stakeholders um, it, frankly, from the consumer, if you like, or the patient, um, right through to the capital. Um, and I, I think that's an interesting thing about this sector, is it's so dynamic. Mm. But clearly one of your skills, Philippa, is, is to be able to have that, the, 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 um, the big picture view, but also then to, to really process a lot of complex technical information and at different levels and then discern what really matters. Uh, because, you know, this is where often, um, and I wanted to ask you too, what your uh, initial qualification was. Like if you were starting a business at, at 18, you know, like a couple of decades ago, that, that was, you know, today it's sort of trendy. Everyone's starting their own business, right? If you're not an entrepreneur, you're not cool. But, you know, back then it was much more, certainly from my background, it was much more traditional. You did year 12, you went to uni, you, you know, you yeah. carved a, a, a path through corporate. It doesn't sound like that was your path at all. No, not particularly. And I wish it was only two decades ago, but it's <laughs> much more than two decades ago. Um, I, I came from a, a family of people who had been in business for many generations and um, uh, I, I did start that early business and my my first, um, if you like, real love is, is of business of commerce. And um, What I'll, is it about I, I did, that? What is I it did, about the commerce that, that inspires you? Oh, I think it's about building things. I think it's about being creative and building. I think it's also about the engagement of people. Um, and I think it's also about leadership. It's about building a team of people who, who are believers, um, who will come with you. You don't have to be a startup company to, to engender that culture. That culture is something that builds very successful businesses, very successful enterprises, very successful human endeavours, you know, rely heavily upon leadership, inspiration, and being aspirational from the top. Um, and I like that about business. I did um, study law, but I, I, I wasn't, I've never been a lawyer, but I've studied law. That, that I found a natural uh, area of knowledge that supported some of the um, more complex areas of business. But to your question about the complexities of, you know, multi-feeding of data and so forth, I've always believed in surrounding myself with people who are hopefully smarter than me or who are the best in class, who I could rely upon, who would educate me, who I could go to and troubleshoot problems with, who would without fear or favour tell me what the answer was or tell me what they believe, their belief was in a problem um, and, and whom I could trust to be beside me in the trenches. So I've never been a believer in, in 
being all knowing and all wise. In fact, the reverse, I think one of the challenges in, in senior executive roles uh, can be summed up in one word and that's humility. Mm -hmm. If one can maintain a level of humility about their thinking, their approach, their relationships, while still being, if you like, a, a firm committed leader, um, confident in themselves and confident in making decisions, but more importantly, confident in making mistakes, um, then those around you step up and join you in, in that very risky business of leadership. So Confident in making mistakes. That's right. I don't think I've heard those two words yeah. juxtaposed like that. Right? And, and Australia are... has been criticised heavily for not supporting failed entrepreneurs or you, yeah. the, in the same way that the US says, well, how many times have you failed before, you know, we, we, we even see that you're serious? So Absolutely. Yeah. Do you we, see we... this in your experience as well? I've had failures. There's no doubt. I've had failures. I've had uh, projects that have been less than successful. Um, I've had situations that I've been disappointed in myself and, and the outcome. And how have you handled that, Philippa? Because I think this is one of the key areas and particularly a lot of women in this area that, you know, you know, is it fear of success or is it, is it really fear of failure or is it fear of success? And Look, I think, I think generally women, um, can, we continuously suffer from that, you know, imposter syndrome, that fraud syndrome, that sensation of I'm not good enough. And we all know these sort of comments that are made where a woman has to be 11 out of 10 to get the job, but a man can be a 5 out of 10 and still be revered. I think to an extent that is true. There was, that is a truism. Um, but um, I, I think in terms of managing failure, uh, there is no doubt that to fail or to be less than successful than you, you have set yourself as a goal uh, is disappointing. So the first thing I think is to accept disappointment is part of life. Disappointment is part of business. Um, disappointment happens to smart people, um, less smart people. Um, it's often not um, uh, sensible to attribute blame, particularly to yourself. And I think that, again, it's a, a little, uh, I suppose, um, much quoted, but I've always said my rule in business is business never lets you make the same mistake twice. If you make that mistake again, you will be punished. So make the mistake. I think be comfortable in the mistake, whatever it is. And then rise out of the ashes, move forward, and don't make the same mistake again because you may not get through the mistake a second time. So I think. So where you know, did you learn this, Philippa? Like it sounds like I mean, you you're obviously extremely competent and confident and clear about your path and how you operate and what what how to create success. Defining moments, or was there? Uh, a role model or something significant where, um, you know, where, where that, uh, where you developed this perspective? Yeah, I, you know, I'm a great believer in people's upbringing, the influence of family, parenting, um, early experiences in leadership. Um, I think uh, early successes and failures. I think, uh, having the time uh, to listen to people around you and surrounding yourself with people who you, not only do you respect them, but you can see their track record is showing you that there's something you must learn. I think it's, it's for me, it's always been about having an extremely open mind to other people's opinion and being really sure that I don't buttress myself in my own fortress with my own thoughts. Um, and whilst other people's opinion, thoughts um, or criticisms don't feel nice sometimes, uh, the wisest position to take is to just listen and make no decision about yourself. Because often people teach you a theory and you personalise it. And it's quite important, I think, as women to try to, to inhibit that natural response, which is, I'm taking this personally, it's a criticism, I'm a failure, um, 
you know, they think poorly of me. Um, no, 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 no. Um, this is a learning. This is something that will make me stronger. This is somebody who's trying to teach me. This is something I might have to learn. Um, if I learn it, I might come out of this stronger. Those theories are, are very difficult to live. Mm. And particularly when your back's to the wall in business or being challenged by colleagues or peers, uh, that's a difficult thing to live by. And I can't say I've always embraced it. But what I have learned is it is better to try and embrace that, to try and live that. And equally, I think you get to a point in your career where you must pass the wisdom on, particularly to other women. Um, and I'm not so gender aligned that I'm only overtly interested in coaching, shaping um, women. I've, I've obviously got a, a strong affiliation with women and young women, and I've got many young women who have worked with me, worked for me, worked around me, who I have great admiration for and who I've seen grow and blossom. And I've, I've always been very keen to help foster their development. But I, I actually think a lot of our hard work as women starts with the men. And I think the more difficult learning is get comfortable with yourself because the minute you're comfortable with yourself, you can get comfortable with the men. Mm. And men, the men actually like coaching. Why? Because men have always played team sports. Men have always been hierarchical. Men have always run the military or the governments or whatever, and much to our chagrin. But a statement of fact is they have been in the position where they've run to the hierarchy, uh, saluted to the boss, um, taken the criticism on the chin and moved on to fight another day. And uh, um, that's not solely a male trait, but when one learns to get comfortable with that as, uh, as a very um, distinct trait in that gender group, um, that's when you can bring about the greatest influence, of course. Because you, have sadly, to be at, you have to be at the table, don't you? You have to and, be at the and table. And sometimes you have to, what was it? It was uh, um, Sandberg, Lean In. She said, even if you, sometimes you're going to have to bring your own chair and make sure that you take your seat at the table and not yes. give it up for someone. Exactly. Don't so give it up. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I, and, the power yeah. base is sitting traditionally and typically it's sitting with the men. So you need to know who you're sitting with, who's opposite you. And without being overly prejudiced or biased in your approach, um, you need to give your permission, yourself permission to be as firm, as direct, as clear thinking, as critical, as supportive as they are, and, and also be comfortable with your own vision, your own aspirations, and put them forward. Because Generally speaking, the table respects that. Mm. And I guess that's, that's the, um, the key, isn't it? If you want that seat at that table to be heard, to be acknowledged, to influence, then, there, then you need to perform at a certain level. So, yeah. and, and again, uh, uh, like you, it's not just a male, female thing, but because men have created the world in which, you know, we are now pushing into um you know there are there are learnings and there is Learning. a lot of focus on on the value of um stem trained individuals yeah. so in mm. the in the traditional sciences yeah. and now what i'm hearing philippa is that you haven't come through the traditional sciences training from a you know from that um, you know, science or engineering or uh, the, the traditional STEM backgrounds. And yet you have all the, your, your thinking processes are extremely data-driven, evidence-driven yes. and process-driven. Mm -hmm. And with the, um, the, the command tone required to be heard. Yeah, look, that's, that's true. My my academic background isn't in, uh, in STEM, uh, but I think I understand it quite well. Uh, I understand the drivers um, and I understand, you know, if you're running a team of 50 software engineers, what does that mean? If you're developing a medical device, 
um, that's diagnostic, that requires complex regulatory pathways and um, uh, many millions of dollars invested in it and managing the risks around that and so forth. And how, how do you structure an organisation to develop that and, and get you the outcomes you want? And um, these are, are ways of thinking that can be applied across many different types of activities. When it comes to women in STEM, you know, I happen to think that women uh, have an absolute inherent gift in process thinking. I think it's inherent in us to be extremely sequential, um, to be extremely, let's call it organised. And I don't mean that in an old fashioned way of running the household. I'm talking about actually sequential thinking um, and to be very evidence based. I find women uh, um, uh, commonly or typically are uh, often better with the detail. Yes, and the, thoroughness, the, the thoroughness to the detail. Yeah, they're very wise to the detail. But over and above all of that, um, it's, it's important to encourage women to follow their instincts as it relates to consequential thinking. Because consequential thinking, I think, is inherent in women. I think it's learnt in men. Now, it's, it's so can you give us an example of that, Philippa, to, to demonstrate that? I think, generally speaking, um, engineers will think in a linear man manner. So they will think A plus B will equal C. When we get to C, we can then contemplate D. Once we get to D, we'll know whether E and F are possible. Women go to F and work yep. backwards and say, if we want to get to F, we'll have to do A and B at the same time. Can we do it at the same time? Yes, we can. How will we do it at the same time? Well, we'll, we'll deploy these resources, we'll make these investments, we'll, we'll and, and then we'll get to D really quickly, we'll bypass C. Once we're at D, we know F is possible because we've worked backwards from F to D. And so I might sound like I'm confused. It's not confusing. That thought process that says the consequence of this action brings about this reaction. Once we have that reaction, we've got a, a certain number of pathways we can take. But where is it that we want to get to? Let's work backwards from there. So that ability to have a, a duplicit or multi, multi-faceted mm -hmm. approach to a problem, I've seen women sit very comfortably with that. They don't find it confusing. I've seen uh, some brilliant male engineers, and this is a generalisation. I, I certainly don't want to sound like I'm uh, eroding the skill and talent of men because in fact men count away the creativity you know the cre creative side of the women the best groups of engineers scientists are a diverse group and I think that's the message I'm making here that so yeah so a diverse group so you have you have some who are very strong in that linear thinking yes and then others who can be it's almost like being comfortable with more ambiguity, but Absolutely. there is still a method in the madness, yes. right? Because there's a lot of talk about the VUCA world, the volatility, the uncertainty, the complexity, yes. ambiguity. Mm. And what I'm hearing from you, your experience is that that women with STEM backgrounds, or you know, in in uh, highly technology uh, driven arenas, are uh, perhaps more able to to actually continue to move forward in that complexity and ambiguity and yeah, not have to have A plus B equals C before they can do D. Mm. Especially when you're developing um, products, technologies or devices or any form of application that uh, finds itself in the hands of people who are vulnerable, who are unwell, who are uh, at a point where um, they need to be protected or it, it, so the key really learning of this in STEM is ultimately you're building, designing, inventing, commercializing something that's going to help somebody do something better. Get There's a, better a human outcome. at the end of it. There's a human but at the end of it, there are some human beings. The yeah. beneficiaries of your work are people. And this is something that I've spent a lot of time through my career 
with the engineers, the scientists and so on saying, remember what our organizational chart looks like and it's circular. And in the middle of it, there's somebody, there's somebody. Mm. And so every day when you're thinking about what you're doing and what you're trying to achieve, uh, it's important that you keep in mind that it's, it's a human being or, or humanity that we're serving in some way. Even if it's a service orientated technology solution, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, a, yeah. it's, it's, it's about having an empathic response to the, to the development work you're doing, mm -hmm. to, if it's inventive or if it's, if it's um, uh, medical in nature, uh, diagnostic in nature, therapeutic in nature, it's about the human being. So human beings tend to be very ambiguous people, don't mm -hmm. we? <laughs> and so having your, having your team, your STEM team, with a, a, a good balance between highly qualitative, highly quantitative thinkers yep. always brings about a, a lot of argument, a lot of discussion, but through that a level of rigour that says what we end up with, someone's going to like, someone's going to use, someone's going to get a benefit from it. Mm. Because overseeing the development, the invention, the, the manufacturing of things that no one wants, that's failure. And it's, uh, it's very expensive for everyone concerned. Absolutely. Well. Absolutely. Mm. And very disappointing for, for everybody uh, who come on the, on the journey with you. Mm. So uh, I think for, um, for women though, um, the world is opening up so dramatically compared to what it was 20 or 30 years ago. In the last 10 years, it's become exciting. You've got a lot of women in leadership. And, you know, the thing that I always implore with other women is just make sure you take all the women with you. Ah, oh, now that's an interesting point. I'd um, love to hear your experience of that, whether clearly you are a very inclusive you know, again, that confidence, that competence. I'm not hearing any scarcity mentality. I'm not hearing any sense of threat by anybody else in the room. No. Uh, you know, and as you, as you said, you look for people with complementary skills and, and, and different uh, levels of, um, of, of, of competence to, to uh, create something bigger than the whole and to be very purpose-driven in how you approach that. What's been your experience with women supporting women? Because this is a, a very, um, can be a moot point for uh, women who, who perhaps are not as abundant in their thinking or as inclusive in their perspective. Well, look, there's no doubt that women have struggled to support each other because to an extent they've been um, working on their own, fighting with one hand behind their back, shadow boxing with with things they don't understand often um, and being subject to a degree of bias by the patriarchal society around them that tends to breed a if you like an every man for himself attitude so how did you deal with that uh, i think through a, 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 if you like a, a type of firm uh, egalitarian confidence it didn't matter whether I was with a man or a woman, it was always equal to me. I didn't see any threat from one or weakness on another or vice versa. I just, I've always taken everybody on balance, what they were offering, what they were saying, but without fear or favour, would tackle it head on or would support it, um, you know, without, without question, if I believed it was right. And where did you learn that? I'm not sure. I think it was um, probably a, a, a very rich life growing up, a, a very good education, a very, um, a very solid family around me, a very strong uh, parents uh, who had a very strong sense of equity and fairness about everybody. So I suppose a sense, funnily enough, it comes back to a probably deeper if you like more philosophical concepts around social justice to people and, and to look upon people around you, whether they're equals 
and whatever that word means, mm. you know, I, that's a very, um, that's a word with a hook in it that I don't like. But what I mean is people of a similar background or people who are like you or not like, everybody has got something to offer. And whilst you, you, you might provide that to others, you must demand it for yourself. That was always my motto. If I give it to others, I will demand it of others. Ah, now that is not typical, that attitude of selfing for a lot of women, particularly no. in that middle corporate arena where yep. pleasing the boss, pleasing the team, and there's nothing left for me. Exactly. And they come into leadership training because they want to know how they can help their team. But there's yep. no sense of what do I need out of this? Start, start here. <laughs> start okay. here. Because you become a much more powerful, more persuasive um, individual. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, helping your colleagues, male or female, is almost, I think, an obligation of, of the privilege of having a job. Mm -hmm. I, I know that sounds, you know, rather extreme. But if, you're, if you live in a country like Australia, you're well-educated, you have a job, you have a future, um, you have an obligation to those around you to help support them and bring them forward. Uh, and I think that's certainly as a woman, that's one of the most profound, empowering, um, profoundly empowering uh, attitude to maintain, which is what can I do for these people around me and particularly young women who are struggling with their confidence, who feel the intensity of the aggressive competition whose natural personality sometimes does not lend itself to that environment, but who still have ambitions and desires and, and a lot to contribute. Giving them a free run is very important. I, I've always had a motto with people around me, and particularly the women, particularly women. You know, I used to always give you enough rope, but not enough to hang yourself. Yes. You know, it's an old, it's a crass saying, but you know what I mean by that. In other words, you must give women the opportunity to take risks. Mm. You must. And you must allow women to take those risks and fail, to take those risks and support them, to take those risks and fix it if it's a problem, to show them how to take the risk, to have the courage, to be, to be confident about themselves, to say, it doesn't matter if I fail, I'm going to go for it because somebody's there watching my back. Women need other women to watch their back. And that's something I encourage. But I encourage it with, with men as well that I work with. I always say to people, look, I'll watch your back. It's fine. Go for it. If you, if you, come into, if you have a problem, come back to me. Everything can be, every problem can be solved. We know that in science. We know that in engineering, can't we? I always say to engineers, we can invent anything. We can do anything. But if you blow it up, we're going to have to fix it. And that's okay. So women really need that sort of help from other women, I think. And I'm hearing that that's the voice of the system or the responsibility <laughs> of a strong, collaborative forward-thinking yeah. leadership team who is uh, truly so. leading yeah right? and and is actually um yeah is 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 actioning their words and yeah. uh, and uh, and this i think philippa have you written a book yet <laughs> like I, no but i i tell you i want to i've got a number of books in me oh you oh and, you definitely yeah. have because yeah. they're such a strong voice of that's more than confidence and competence and all those, you know, sort of um, typical uh, and analytical, you know, problem solving, all the STEM based skills that we're identifying are so important um, in where, you know, how we're going to create this new normal post COVID. And, and yeah. that that's why we want, we need risk takers, don't we? We do. We, we need do. risk takers. We need and communicators takers. though. We need communicators. And yeah. I think often the, the people with the, 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 the strong technical skills and all that wonderful technical creativity are not, and perhaps not blessed with the communication skills. And it seems to be a very hard road to become as articulate and competent 
and to give voice to all those ideas if you haven't got some of it like innately which clearly you know you do as as well as all the learnings and 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 the the self-determined um you know success that i i, I hear mm -hmm. you've created mm. and um so i think articulating how the how of leadership is really um is is, is a real gap that i think someone like yourself would, would you know could help accelerate that learning process you know, sure. for, the, for the women coming, coming uh, uh, I'm, I'm, you know. I'm sure, I'm sure it's necessary in, in the STEM sector because <clears throat> there are just so many young women who I talk to who want more. They want more. They want to hear more. And they want to be more and they want to contribute more. But <laughs> yeah, it's on that note, Philippa, in the last, you know, few minutes of our conversation here, I guess, you know, are there some um, specific, uh, you know, advice or if there, if you were talking to your younger self or looking back, you know, 20 years ago, that if you had that, you would have, been, you know, been uh, further along faster or, or if there's there's something that stands out that would be helpful to, to our emerging leaders coming through. I, I think to maintain the courage to, um, to believe in yourself, I think, um, like everybody, I've had moments when I've felt I was failing or had failed. And that can bring you down. Um, I think to also maintain the, the, the knowledge that um, you're judged as you judge others. Mm -hmm. So it's a level playing field, really. And I think the third ah, thing... Ah, that's that a belief. That's a, that's a, that's a belief. And and because mm -hmm. so much of what we language is what we see and what we create. Yeah, and it I is a level playing field. Mm. Yeah, but you have to learn that, and you have to be given opportunities to understand that it is a level playing field. And I think um, uh, it's most unwise to hold on to any sense of victimisation because of your gender. That's the most disempowering position that you can hold for yourself. Because let's face it, there's lots of things we can change. We can't change our gender. That's a broad statement. Of course we can. But I'm talking in the, in the realms yep. of the day-to-day. -day. We are what we are. Uh, and uh, both genders, uh, binary genders, are, um, and anyone in the middle, are what they are. And uh, one should not vest too much importance in, the, in gender disparity or gender language. The minute you do that, you give yourself the excuse to, to give up, to fail, to criticise, to wallow, to, to stop really developing. So uh, to an extent, um, I've not always suffered from all of those problems, but I've stood back and I've learned from, if, if you don't do that, then the outcome is negative. So, and I suppose to your question about how did I get here, I, I, I'm one of six girls. So I never really considered men as being of much value at all till I was about 18. <laughs> so, and where were, you, where were you in the six? Number five. Wow. Number five. So, so mm. wow. Yeah, five out of... Well, I guess you needed to speak up to be heard or get That's lost right. in the middle, right? Because the youngest would have been the baby, the oldest is the leader, and then everyone yep. else between is struggling for position. Oh, That's goodness. right. That's right. And uh, uh, so, uh, but look, so the younger self of me may well have encouraged me to be a little less assertive, contrary to what, you know, maybe, uh, you know, wisdoms of other women. It, I think sometimes I was a little too strong, a little too assertive. So life had to teach me to soften the edges. Okay. To be em empathic, to maintain that humility. So that, that in it, that's a challenge as much as it is to try and develop it. 
interesting, isn't it? Yes. So the, yeah, when, and again, it's that, um, you know, the, the double-edged sword of, of something that is so needed for business development and successful yes, uh, product yes. development. And, you know, is that assertiveness, is that energy around that? And at the same time, you know, there needs to be that adaptability to be able to pull back when need be and to be able to listen and, and, and not necessarily speak. So, and that's good to hear that that, that is just as difficult to pull back from being too much that of that more uh, what's usually associated with uh, the male uh, male trait. Well, you know, as you know, when when a girl is too assertive, exactly. she's a bully. And when a girl <laughs> when a girl is into detail, she's nitpicking. Yes. You know, and uh, that's that's these are the this is the language that we need to get rid of. Mm. It's actually not the right language anymore. Not in research, not in technology. You know, technology is a great equaliser, isn't it? Mm. I mean, yes. never before have we have we seen a, a vertical like like STEM that is so ubiquitous in its opportunities for both men and women. Mm. Mm. Where people and are judged, they're judged on their skills, their knowledge, their learning, and what they can produce. Mm. But you know, a lot of that. A lot of that comes from the leadership. So, it, you know, it's very important that women find themselves in positions of leadership and find themselves in that position without the sense of those around them thinking that they've been bullied, they've bullied their way to it. That narrative's got to stop. Yeah. Right? Women, women, women are tough, women are smart, are competent, are capable, and, and frankly, um, the aggression assertion argument leaves me cold. Uh, but I, I do counterweigh that, as I said earlier, it's very important to keep an empathic and humble approach to whatever you're doing, whether you're male or female. And that's, I think, something that women in STEM also need to be comfortable with. Mm. And therein is that um, the diversity uh, perspective yeah. as well that again we want people who have that greater level of sensitivity and creativity and intuitive way of um, you know of sensing and feeling that they also need to they perhaps need to be taught how to speak up and be more assertive and then the assert people who are more naturally assertive and uh, decision making and and perhaps see themselves leading and 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 are uh, driven by uh, being that 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 leader, there is that um, the the crossover of learning and and acceptance and being able to um, to flex as, as we need to. Sure, um, and and I think to, to my earlier point too, um, learn to be comfortable with the men, take them with you. They they need they do need us to open that door. It's not our fault that the door's closed. I'm, that's not attributing blame. But it is for, for young women who are on a level playing field with male colleagues in STEM, um, you can take them with you. You can go with them. It's, it's equal. It's absolutely equal now. And everybody knows it and respects mm. it and believes it. And, and the young women need to start believing it and, and, and accepting that that's where they're at. The doors are opening. They are open. Breeze is yes. coming in. Get on board. That that is really um, really exciting to hear. That where you know you um, are a leader and a trailblazer and have been for at least the last ten years in in the medical technology and healthcare and aged care industry, Philippa and and um, you know as we uh, close our conversation today, I, I want to. Um, thank you again for your time and your perspective, um, because there are so there's so many, um, I guess, um, like indicators of how your mind works that I think are going to be really useful um, to the uh, the younger leaders who are looking for what's that magic source, right? We all know there is no one thing. There's no magic source, but there is, there's so much in who we are and how we think about things up here. 
Um, mm. And uh, so I really thank you uh, for your time today. It's a pleasure. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Philippa. Bye-bye.